we said that there are three different other options to Gudanov scheme and also the muzzle scheme. So we are going to discuss now how to compute fluxes using those schemes in this module. So the first one we will look into is a centered flux scheme. So centered flux scheme is basically taking into account very simple averaging process. So let us say we have two elements which are there to an interface. So this interface is called as ij like here and there are two triangles neighboring to that. The field that we are going to compute here at the interface is nothing but average of those two fluxes. So whatever value that we are talking about, so we might have E field given at the center. say we say E i H i and here we have E i plus 1 comma H i plus 1. So we are going to say the field at this point will be the flux that is basically average of these two. So if we say flux on this left side is F i and the flux on the right side is i plus 1, so we are taking the average. This particular scheme should be used with care. I will explain you what is the potential problem by doing this. It works in most cases, but we have to take into account how we are going to do the time stripping. When we, when we discuss about the time stripping, I will say when we can safely use the scheme for most of the problem. So that is a pretty easy approximation. So that is a simple centered flux scheme. So the second one is truly upwind scheme. Let us say we have a node that we are interested in and this node let us say we call the node i and what is happening now is uh, we are interested in knowing what are the ways in which this node is connected to other triangles. So we might have triangles So we are interested in the node, let us say this node. So what we are going to get is this node is connected to the neighboring barycenters in some way. So we can be very specific about two triangles and then their dimension. So as you can see in the slide, we have two triangles we just take node values which are the nodal values and we are going to compute the value of the field in a point as the summation of all the neighboring triangles weightages. So whatever is here is nothing but summation of all the neighboring triangles and their respective weights. So the weights will be assigned such that if a node is very close to a barycenter, this triangle will have more weight compared to an another one. So let me extrapolate this. Let us say you have two triangles like this and uh, we are computing the value of the flux here and there are two barycenters here and we are computing also the nodal values here. So when you take a node, this barycenter will be very far compared to this barycenter. So when you are computing the value of the field at the node, the field function will be dependent on the distance of the barycenters away from that particular node. So the weight for this triangle will be more compared to the weight of this triangle. So that is what you see here in this equation. So this equation is, is saying there is a weighting of the field. So we can write the equation in a much more simple form. So f of n is equal to sigma let us say L goes to 1 to n L and then we are talking about W L f n l divided by the weighting 
sum of all weighting. So, the top part will be weighted sum as I explained to you. So, whatever node is closer will give more weightage and then it will get added up and then finally, we are dividing it by the sum of all weights. This thing is a little bit more heavy as you see we are kind of moving away from the barycentric approach. I told you the flux values are computed at the interface, but the values of the E field and the H field are located in the barycenters. By going to this method of truly upwind scheme, we are actually trying to compute the values at the nodes. In a way, it is slightly similar to finite element method, which has its pros and cons. You have to do more computation. Doing more computation, you might get better accuracy. And also, you can play around with the weighting function itself. I have never used this particular scheme for most of the practical problems, because simply the computation is too heavy. I do not want to have too much heavy computation for just the fluxes. So, in that sense, I just wanted to give you an idea about the truly upwind scheme, but we never use it for most of the problems. The idea is as I explained, F n will be the interpolated nodal fields, the nodal weights of each of the triangles, the barycentric field values of those triangles. So, the next one is called as geometrical reconstruction scheme. As the name says, instead of looking at a particular triangle's neighbors, I look into a control volume itself. So, I can compute the value of the flux based on the geometry of each of the control volumes. So, the geometry tells me approximately what will be this r and 2 r. They are basically you know they are coming from the uh, vertex to the face centers. So, you can compute what this r and 2 r are for the individual triangles and based on that you can approximate uh, the value of the face centers because we know this distance, you know this distance and you know this distance. So, basically you can extrapolate the values from the center to here. So, that is a that is a very a simple approach, but it has also certain computational restrictions. We are increasing our computation per cell. So, each of the cells we have to do it, but one way is you can do this already in your pre-processing. So, you do not need to rerun this every now and then because you already know based on the domain you are you having these values are already fixed. So, the field computation is based on the geometrical properties, no need to compute gradients at the barycenters, because in the case of the muzzle scheme as you remember, we are going to compute the value of the gradient. The gradient is uh, the value between the face center and the barycenter, this we do not do it here. So, there in a way there is a improvement, but still it is not a bigger improvement, but this scheme is much better than the truly upwind scheme where you do not do too much computation. So, having discussed all the various uh, approaches of computing fluxes, the most important thing is uh, to look into the time discretization itself. So far, we have not talked about time discretization, which is one of the main chunk of the computation itself, because uh, only doing spatial discretization does not help. We have to also look into the time discretization and uh, we want a scheme that is simple enough but at the same time also stable. So, as you know some of the schemes like Euler method which we discussed in the finite difference method lectures is not that stable because it creates unstable solutions and, and it is mostly considered to be unstable. So, the kind of scheme what we are going to use now the case of finite volume time domain is a method called as lax Wendroff scheme. Let us look at it in detail. So, as you can see in the slide, we are interested in time stepping like in the case of leapfrogging method, we are interested also in the half steps, but there is a difference here. The difference is our E and H field are located in the same point, which is very different to finite difference method. If you remember in finite difference method in our earlier lectures, E field is in one point and the H field is in another point. So, if you talk about E field in the n minus 1, n and n plus 1, H field are located in the half steps. But in the case of finite volume, remember we said it is going to be co-located. When it is co-located, we can compute the 
half time stepping for both E and H at the same time and we will use this value to improve our guess of what is going to happen in the next step and we will go forward. So, let me explain this in this slide here. So, the first correct first step what we are doing let us say we are going from So, this is n minus 1, n minus half, n, n plus half and n plus 1. So, the first thing what we are doing is called as the predictor. I am predicting the values of what is going to be my E and H in the next step. So, I have the value of E and H here and they are in the time step n minus 1. So, I am predicting the value of E and H in the n minus half and I am using that value to improve my prediction. So, this is called as the character step. So, in the character step I am using instead of n minus 1, I am using n minus half. So, I am correcting my prediction corrector. So, I get my value of at n. So, this is basically a kind of a clever way to say I do not just use my value n minus 1 to compute at n, then it will be a simple Euler method. I am doing a half time stepping. In a way, you can say this method is kind of Euler method with small time steps. So, instead of taking a big time step, I take a small time step, I predict it, I use this value to compute the value in the front. So, this will keep on going after here what I will do is I will use this value to predict the value here and I will improve that value to the next step. So, it keeps going. So, that is what we have described in this slide. So, if I go back, so I I use this value to compute here, I jump, I compute here and then I jump. So, depending on which literature you are following, people call it lax Wendroff scheme or predictor corrector method. I just wanted to repeat the leapfrogging time stepping, which we normally use in, in the finite difference method for a particular reason. Leapfrogging method can also be used here, but we can only use it in a flux computation method. Remember I told you while we are discussing the flux averaging scheme, you have to pay attention to how you are computing the flux averaging scheme and when to apply that flux averaging scheme. So, flux averaging scheme can be used in the case of leapfrog method. So, where you are basically computing the values of E n minus 1 and H half and then you are jumping E n and then H n plus half and then E n plus 1. So, this is the standard approach of doing the leapfrogging method. You can use this also in the case of finite volume time domain method. Instead of just using it only in the finite difference method, you can also use it in the finite volume method, but then you have to compute your fluxes differently. So, in this case, in some of the problems we tried, we, we also used uh, this method for doing the time stepping, although this is not the main way to go forward. So, with this, we have covered pretty much the various aspects of time stepping. We have looked into various aspects of how we are computing the fluxes and also the, the basic way of uh, structuring a problem and getting the finite volume formulation. But that is not everything, right. So, if you wanted to run a problem, you need inevitably certain boundary conditions. Again, when we talk about boundary truncation, there are different ways to go forward with it. So, we will discuss in modules coming next what are the different accurate truncation possibilities that we have for finite volume time domain problems. So, we will look at it in the next module.